Welcome back to the program, Mom Zev Brenner with us. Once again, Rabbi Yoel Schoenfeld, he is the spiritual leader of the Rabbi of Young Israel, Kew Garden Hills, rabbinic coordinator for the Kasher's Division of OU, as well as Vice President Coalition for Jewish Values, and he's son of the legendary Rabbi Fabian Schoenfeld of blessed memory, whose Shloshim we just commemorated. So, Rabbi Schoenfeld, thank you for joining us, and I want to extend my sincere condolences about the passing of your father, a wonderful and a great leader. Thank you, Zeb. Much appreciated. You know, I go back with your father many years. I've had him on over the course of time. He was a firebrand. He was not afraid to speak out. So growing up in that household, tell us, and let's recollect about some of the accomplishments of what your father has done over the course of his rabbinate. He's founding well, rabbi of Young Israel at Kew Garden Hills, too. Founding rabbi of Young Israel at Kew Garden Hills going back to 1951. Started with uh, 12 people in a basement, and um, basement of, of uh, uh, Nat and Mary Saperstein. And um, that time, actually, my father had other offices in other communities outside of New York that were already uh, established communities. And uh, but my father ultimately turned that down because he, he somehow uh, uh, figured to be a future in this little fledgling group. And the right he was, because those other communities that uh, were offering jobs today are dwindling terribly. They're almost completely off the map. So, you know, he, he came to this little group of 12 people and really built the community. And, uh, and from there, he, he really grew into a, a major force and a major presence in so many different uh, Jewish aspects and fields. Wow. Um, yeah. And so, also helped uh, to help yeah. he helped build orthodoxy in America too, because you had modern orthodoxy. He was a modern orthodox rabbi, but he had you had to fight for your turf. Yeah, see, my father's greatness was that he was equally comfortable and equally appreciated and admired, as you said, in mo the modern orthodox world, the Hasidic world, very tied to Ger. Fasemis yeah, was one of his. Uh, main sources that he would quote his drushes from. Of, and, of course, he was a Talmud of Rav Yashiber Soloveitchik Zatal. Uh, never gave a shear that he wasn't quoting him. And uh, and yet my my father also was a great disciple of the works of Rav Hirsch. And, uh, he, and he, has a, he has a guy like me as a son, and then he has a, I have a brother in Switzerland, Rabbi Yari Schoenfeld, who's a real Ger of Husid. And he has uh, a lot of mishpacha in uh, in Israel, many, many grandchildren in Israel, of course, children and grandchildren in Israel, that are kippas rugot, and kippot rugot. And, you know, so it's the Dati Lumi crowd. And he is was equally comfortable in all these settings. He was at home at all, in, in all settings. And, you know, maybe you're a Gera Chusid, you're a YU guy. You know, that Kilo Uma, the Umi guy, it, it's totally irrelevant to him as long as you're common thread, that, you know, that you're sincere about your Torah commitment. Now, but the, and, uh, there were challenges to orthodoxy, both on the right and even on the left of Mount Orthy. I know he was not afraid to go to battle with what he felt was the right thing to do. Perhaps you can, let's look at some of the things. He wasn't afraid to right. speak out. Some rabbis are afraid to speak out. He wasn't. My father was never afraid to speak out. That's absolutely true. And, you know, we, we hear, you know, in, in this now, in the year 2020, 21, this whole, for the last 30, 40 years, um, you know, our generation has been sitting, you know, comfortable, orthodoxy is growing, thank God. But we don't realize that there were so many rabbis in the 1950s and the 1960s that were, that were in the battlefield fighting. The reform was not the big challenge to them because that was too much on the fringes, but the conservative movement at that time was growing and it was swallowing up uh, Orthodox shuls one by one, and the chitzes were coming down. And the conservative brand of Jewry was becoming very, very appealing to many people of Orthodoxy whose background was not that strong. And, uh, and the chitzes was a huge issue then. Microphones and shuls were a big, big issue. And my father, among many other heroic rabbis, and kashras standards was a huge issue, because kashras not only had to be taken on from the uh, from the, the less uh, orthodox who, who had their own standards, 
uh, that were not obviously up to Orthodox standards, but then you had even some old European type rabbonim that were giving hashkachas that were totally lacking in, um, in, in, in in their standards, and they were just they came from Europe. They felt they had to give hashkachas to, to slaughterhouses and places like that, totally lacking. And so the battle had to be waged on both ends for kashrus. And um, uh, so it was, and, and th- these were battles that these, that these rabbis, primarily primarily RCA rabbis, were fighting, you know, and they don't quite get the credit that they deserve, whether it was in New York or Columbus, Ohio, or Wichita, Kansas, these, or Kansas City. These rabbis were out there fighting the fight, Long Island. So, yes, yeah, my father was very, very much a part of that. And he was not afraid to speak out. Uh, both uh, in speeches and in writing. We come across so much of his letters where he really went to battle with, uh, and sometimes within his own co- with his own colleagues about having to keep up the standards that he feels must be done. Well, I think we covered uh, we covered you know, a battle between your father, Rabbi Yitz Greenberg, where I think there was a movement to take him out of the Rabbinical Council of America. We actually had a program, and that program, I think, saved Rabbi Yitz Greenberg from being thrown out of the Rabbinical Council of America. But I remember that, oh, really? that we had them both together on a TV show many, many years ago. I, could have, I, didn't, I didn't know that. That might have been interesting. But, uh, I'm not sure how my father... What his public expression about uh, Yitz Greenberg was, I know uh, privately he was and, and very upset with some of the things he's, he said and, and stood for. Um, but the RCA, I don't know, if, uh, truth is, I don't know where my father stood on that. I know the RCA ultimately took a position uh, not to throw him out. Um, but, uh, you know, but my father was the consummate gentleman also. So, you know, whatever his feelings he may have had, he... He might have tempered that in the public arena. Because it just the worst thing my father would ever do, and this he got from his Rebbe Rav Soloveitchik, the worst thing what he would ever do is assassinate a person's character publicly. And that 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 thing he would just never ever do. So um, uh, it, it you no, know, I'm sure in the public arena my father was a gentleman, but uh, you know, but but there obviously were major differences. Um, between him and somebody like Rabbi Greenberg, and there are other people who have come along since. But um, that's why my father had universal respect, even by his adversaries, because he, they all detected that he was sincere, educated in what he was talking about, and totally committed. And at the same time, he was a gentleman's gentleman. So um, that's why he had that universal respect. And, you know, at, at, and, and, you know at the Levi, we had a Levian show. Two, two Hasidic uh, speakers. One was Rabbi uh, Albaum from our neighborhood. Um, you know, Hasidic, huge town of Chacham. The other one was my uncle, Nidvan Rebbe, of Shlomo Leifa. Uh, you know, and Nidvan Rebbe. And those were the only two speakers at the Levi we had in Shul. And, and, and yet, on the, on the solution that we had the other day, uh, so you had people like uh, Herschel Shechter, Menachem, Rabbi, 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 Rabbi Herschel Shechter, Rabbi Menachem Ganak, uh, Rabbi Lenny Matanki from from um, a Chicago area, who was uh, a pre- former uh, president of the RCA, but many years, the junior of my father was very close with him, and Malcolm Holmline, a nephew of Rick Schindelheim, too, but Ma- and Malcolm Holmline, who, who I wanted Malcolm to speak, because I wanted him to represent what my father's impact in the broader Jewish world, including the secular world. And, and, and he, was, he was very impactful. And Malcolm was a huge fan of my father politically and on a personal level. Rabbi Yo Schoenfeld is our guest. We're paying tribute to his father, Rabbi Fabian Schoenfeld, of blessed memory. So let's look at his impact in the greater Jewish community. We spoke the religious one. What about the greater Jewish one? What did he do? What did he accomplish? Well, he, he brought respect. He brought respect uh, of, of orthodoxy to, and to, to, um, to the wider Jewish community. Uh, not always did he win those battles because they were they were sailing off on their own, but he brought a respect and dignity that they had, and that was especially in those years in the 50s, 60s, and later, uh, they they had to orthodoxy was just losing respect. It was considered a relic of the past. But even but even beyond those years, uh, many of the battles that had to be fought concerning Israel, attitudes towards Israel. Uh, he he, um, he he brought to the table at that president's conference meetings and the UJA 
a father, and those years back, was extremely active in the UGA. He felt it was a vital organization at the time. So, you know, he, and people just respect him. I, one of my father's closest relationships actually was a bishop, Bishop Murphy. Um, and, and, he, and he just he said, and Bishop Murphy would say, I've never met such a, um, an angelic person like your father. They had this, uh, so wherever he went, he just brought uh, respect and Kiddush Hashem for the... Uh, for so tell us about Bishop stories. Murphy. How did that come about, and what did they do together? Because they, they I, I, my father was, as and Malcolm mentioned this when he spoke at the Shloshim, my father was chairman of some high-held position, I think he was chairman of Ichkik, which is the International Jewish uh, Committee of Relations. Uh, but but that, that was the, uh, the branch that... They yeah, did that with the Vatican, with, right? With the Vatican, reaching out to the non-Jewish world, and, and and following the guidelines of Rav Soloveitchik as they were, and that's what brought him into the to get to know certain Christian people, and eventually he, he Bishop Murphy is from Long Island, uh, and eventually he got a uh, he, he developed a, a personal relationship with, with Bishop Murphy, and. Um, but that, you know whether you know whether you can view okay what do you gain by having a bishop as your friend? That's not the point. The point is the the, uh, the respect that he commanded. So um, uh, and, and so uh, you know I can't say you know you chalk up another victory, another victory. It's hard to know. I'll tell you. But, but one of the victories that my father uh, had with other opponents was fighting the blue laws. The blue laws, the, the blue laws in the 1950s were very serious threat to, to, to Orthodox way of life because you could not open up a store on Sunday um, because that was the, that was the Christian Sabbath. Too bad that you closed on Saturday. Too bad on you, but you can't open up on on Sunday either. So those blue laws had to be fought uh, in in in, uh, in Albany elsewhere uh, to see to it that Jews can open up business on Sunday. And now it's, uh, of course, it's a whole, a whole uh, entirely different story. But that, you know, the stores are open up all over the place. The Macy's, everybody's open on Sunday. But in those years, you could not open up on Sunday, and it was a real threat to the lifestyle of the Jewish businessmen. They fought that battle. They won that battle. The Battle of Mechitzas was a huge battle, and um, but eventually they they prevailed. Um, as when you say battle Mechitzas, you know, what do you mean? Know, my father fought. My father fought and was victorious. Because Young Israel movement had a lot. It had I remember Young Israel Flatbush advertised and others had social dancing, which at some point stopped. But the Young Israel movement did have that. Yeah, there's no question. You can't erase that. The Young Israel definitely did, did have it. But I'm talking social dancing at their own dinners. Now, what took place at weddings that you know that that, that hire the halls? It's a different story. But as far as the, it, having social dances at their own dinners. That was uh, that was a real battle because Balabatim did not understand what's wrong if I dance with my wife and somebody else dancing with their wife, which by the way didn't always work that way. They would throw you up in trade partners in the middle, but um, but that was a, that was a, that was a huge battle and Balabatim didn't understand what's the problem here. Um, but uh, it was fought and it was a battle that ultimately was won. I don't think you'll see a serious young Israel today that would have social dancing by their own official events. But this this, didn't, this things just didn't evolve. This didn't happen. Conscious didn't happen on its own. The battle against conservatives did not happen on its own. These were these were hard fought battles in the fifties and sixties that our generation tends to overlook. And but he was in those trenches, and then he was a big uh, a, a lochem and a, a fighter for Kushim Munim at that time was called for the rights of, of Jewish uh, people to, to settle in Eretz Yisrael Ashlema, and you know both sides of the. Uh, of the, of, of, the, of the Jordan, and uh, um, you know, after '67, so um, you know that was uh, he was uh, everything was a battle. You know, I'm sitting here resting on his laurels. Those battles are already behind me. Would you, behind would, would, it, would it be fair to say that you know there's been talking about the modern Orthodox movement has moved to the right over the course of time? Would it be fair to say that your father was a catalyst in helping the modern Orthodox movement move to the right? He was one of those catalysts in helping that. You know, a lot of it is also the you know, impact of the yeshiva world, but uh, my father definitely was. He didn't have people like my father um, to bringing a, a sense of respect to to the uh, to the Orthodox uh, of Orthodoxy out there. Listen, the local conservative rabbi, when my, in the earlier years of my of my um, 
uh, of my father's tenure here in, in Shul, the local conservative rabbi wrote an article. There was a, a, a local paper called the Q Hill View. The Q Hills View. It was about Q Cardin's Hills, and, and you know, people it was a little throwaway paper, but you know, that's what you got. And um, so the local conservative rabbi, when when from people started moving in, especially Shtiblach started popping up. So my father, uh, this guy, this rabbi wrote, "The weeds in the garden." A sickly weed is being transported into our garden, and like ruining the garden of two gardens hills. Um, and uh, my fa- my father, who had a warm personal relationship with this particular rabbi, and 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 uh, in our second generation with his children have a warm relationship, but uh, my father went had to go to battle against that. Uh, so um, the, the, he he these everything here everything here was a battle. And my father's is famous for something very, very important, uh, that when my father's shul started growing, and certainly in the 60s, 70s, it was at its peak with, you know, you, you came 10 minutes late to shul in the 600-seat shul, you, you, did, you, uh, you, didn't, uh, you didn't find a seat. Um, and other shuls started opening, Stiebler started opening, and you can view them comp- competing shuls, and most of the Rabbanim would have the answer, and I've been victim of that myself elsewhere, most of the Rabbanim, would uh, they have the attitude? Hey, listen, we don't need you. We they, we we got the monopoly here. We don't want you coming around. My father had just the opposite attitude. In the in the still in nineteen fifties and sixties, a shul wants to open up. I'm going to help them. I'll provide them with svarim. I'll even lend them people to get their minion going, which is exactly what he did. And his and his viewpoint was that if you have more shuls instead of less shuls, the whole community is going to grow with it. And that's exactly what happened. The, uh, the, the community grew because we had other shuls coming to town. So it was not a monolithic town, and, um, and it was not a one-horse town. He, he lent his, not only his encouragement, but he literally lent people, Balabat, and were willing to help out, to Durham Khamashim, to Pretara, to help these other shuls get started. He, my father's one of the more famous accomplishments. Um, and, uh, Which would make a lot of shuls uh, like to have the monopoly, so to speak. So, but yes. having Stiebluch was interesting. Now today, Kew Garden Hills and surrounding area have a different issue. We have a lot of Bukharian moving in, and the neighbors changing, and people, yes. and they're looking to have their shuls more. So I know there's a little no, tension. That's, that's correct. The Bukharian situation is actually not a not, not, not a happy one. Been a, a lot, a lot of uh, Ashkenazi money poured into the Bukharian community, and. Um, and they're Jews, and we love them as our fellow Jews, but there still remains a culture divide. We just can't seem to bridge together. With them. It might take another generation or two. They just are. My, hey, look, my father, you're talking about Bukharans. My father uh, opened up a shul to when the Bukharans first started moving here in the, in the 19, mid to late, actually late 1970s and 80s, and they had no place to daven. So my father said, here, have my shul free. Of charge, he gave them that a big classroom um, in, the, in the adjacent building to the shul, that, you know, part of the youth center. They had to take this for ten years. They dove in, in that shul. The shul didn't charge them ten cents uh, rent, and um, eventually they said thank you very much, goodbye, and they built their own shul, um, and it just took off from there. But that was my father's attitude with the Bukharans, uh, and 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 the Bukharans are a very valuable asset to the community. Uh, orthodoxy has sprung around them, a lot of, a lot of Bukharan institutions and establishments, but we can't get past that cultural divide. That's try as we may. It's very, very difficult. Well, we're trying to bridge the gap, Rabbi Shem. We happen to have a Bukharan radio show hosted by Rabbi Yitzhak Yeshua, the chief rabbi emeritus and chief dayan of the community. Right. And we have a yeah. lot of Ashkenazim, too, and then we have Bukharan, so we are working to bridge the gap, but it is a different culture, a different style of davening, learning, foods. So it's going yeah. to. So they're part of the community, but they're still separate. We had a Bukharan um, president of our Vada Rabbanim of Queens not too long ago, and we thought that would make a major difference. It 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 didn't. It's going to take a generation or two because they still their toes are still in the water, getting used to American culture. So um, yeah, there's a Bukharan canner yeah, running I, I for think, office now. I think in the neighborhood, so we're going to see more of that involvement. So uh, it's, it's yeah, slowly correct. starting to change. Yeah. Slowly starting to change. Yeah. Now we're we're working yeah. with the Bukharian community. It's a wonderful community, 
and uh, but they still keep themselves separate. They haven't been integrated into the general Jewish community or the general Orthodox community. They have not. They're separate, but right. but it's going to take some time. But you're living close proximity, and people have been moving out, and Bukhais are moving in, so that makes it more challenging. How's the youngest of Kew Garden Hills doing today with the demographic change? Well, the demographics has, has, has indeed hit us hard because what is happening, uh, well, you know, the Bukharans are moving in. Uh, the Shtibla seem to be doing okay, uh, but what's happening is our shul has gotten uh, long in years, and so many people have unfortunately have, have, are, are no, no longer with us, but those who grow older, um, they have, their children have moved out to places like Teaneck, West Hempstead, uh, five towns, and, and so they now move out to join their children uh, to be with them. They're already grandparents in retirement age, and they, they just want to be surrounded by the children. I, how do you fight that? You can't fight it. It's very reasonable. It's very understandable. So that that has impacted on on, uh, on our show. No are younger people, so, are, are any, young people, people moving, any young people, any young people moving in? Yes. Yeah, so the young people, as far as young Israel type of people that move in, you know, like I said, we have a, we have a um, uh, well, it's been hit hard since the COVID ep- ep- um, pandemic and. That's an issue. The young people are just not coming back. That's I've, I've written about. That's painful. But we still have. We had before that pandemic. We had about 125 uh, people come every week to Davin, young marriage. But they stay for a couple of years and then they're off to West Hampstead. Um, so uh, it, it, you know they're trans, you know they're very uh, transient. But so that is a problem, uh, a huge problem. Um, but uh, but so you walk along Main Street, there's there are more uh, kosher establishments. When I was growing up, there were about there was there was a butcher, brass butcher. There was and that was, that was already later in coming. Uh, you had a butcher shop or two, and then you know, I think it was Shimon's Pizza off off open, uh, and that was like big news a pizza shop. shop. Uh, and now there's probably three pizza shops in every block and any kind of uh, um, restaurant that you like to imagine. Banks galore also. Um, so um, it's uh, so Kriegon Hills looks thriving, but the young Israel type of, of shul is is really is not because the the, the people who are moving in are largely Bukharans and then Yeshiva Chavetzayim, a lot of Yeshiva Chavetzayim people, Landis College people, are Arachayim people, and they're really not uh, young Israel type people. So um, it yes, we, we, the demographics it, demographics it's definitely uh, impacted on no question about it. So we still have a very very solid core. Rabbi Oshom, I want to thank you for paying tribute to your father, and I know that you're continuing that legacy. You're a hard worker, and as I mentioned, not only are you the spiritual leader following in your father's footsteps, but my favorite, Shun Schoenfeld of Blessed Memory, who found the youngest of Kew Garden Hills. You're keeping it going right now, despite the challenge that you have. You're also been a coordinator for Conscious Division of the Orthodox Union, Vice President Coalition for Jewish Values. Thank you for being on our program, and May you be comforted among the mourners of Zion in Jerusalem on the loss of your father, who was a very special person who I missed. I enjoyed my conversation with him over the years, and may his memory be a blessing for all of us. I mean, thank you so much, Zeb. Appreciate it. And we're going to be right back. Don't go away. Stay tuned. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please become a fan of Talk Line with Zeb Brenner on Facebook, LinkedIn, Google Plus, and YouTube. On Twitter at Talk Line Network. If you have an Android phone, please download our free app in the Google Store. For iPhones, download the Jewish Radio app. Of course, tune in 24 hours a day at TalkLineCommunications.com for nonstop Jewish broadcasting. Talk Line Network Radio, America's longest-running Jewish broadcast network, the voice of the Jewish community.